Raptors and Usurpers, this is Internet Personality Evangelist, and the latest licensed third-party Transformers release from 3A is also the fourth and final figure to come out in their Dark of the Moon live-action movie lineup. Starscream adds a second Decepticon to the mix and is easily the weirdest design 3A's had to translate into a non-transforming large-scale action figure under this license. I've got a review sample on hand, so let's set the legitimately massive box aside and see how things turned out. Coming in at 16 or 17 inches tall, depending on your digitigrade pleasure, and friggin' 13 inches wide at his shoulders, live-action Starscream is that freaky triangle bird man that we all came to well, discuss online for over five years of cinematic discourse. Whether or not this design is even any good is entirely up to you, so I'm gonna focus on how well 3A translated it into plastic. In short, I think they did a good job. The major details that often translated to transforming toys of this design are present here, from the double crotch plates to the cockpit chest to the pointy thingamies sticking out over his toes. The lack of transformation means I expect the sculpt and proportions to look spot effing on at this price point, and I believe they do. 3A Starscream reaps the mono mode benefits of sleek limbs and slim hips as well as the crazy movie aesthetic surface detail of a billion metallic shards and pistons and cables and things. Everything is sculpted, every panel line is etched, and it's all fully painted and shaded, making stuff like the head look all uber detailed when viewed up close. Since 3A's license is for Dark of the Moon specifically, Starscream's also got those weird Cybertronian body tattoos that he gained during the supplementary fiction for Revenge of the Fallen. That all turned out great, didn't it? Anyway, the glyphs are all here, looking a little thick and somewhat hand-painted. It's a bit of a shame that they had to be present, but they do add an extra bit of busyness to the fully metallic and weathered paint job the figure received. Once again, 3A do a good job in the field of making plastic look like metal, and the weathering here feels more subtle and scuffy than on their Optimus Prime. Perhaps the presence of the tattoos prevented anybody from getting any ideas about the streaky silver weathering layer that I'm glad to see absent on this figure. By the way, when I said plastic, I meant plastic, as Starscream is, for the most part, plastic. His sheer size means he still has a hefty mass, especially with all the ratchet joint mechanisms. A peg and a block of tabs hold Starscream's skull plate in place. If you remove it, you can install three AG1 batteries and flip a switch to activate his red eyes. This looks really nice, but guess who the genius is that bought a pile of cheap, nearly expired AG1 batteries off eBay? Anyway, while the video might not be showing it super well, I did take a photo with my phone when the batteries were at their freshest. It's not as eerily lifelike as the Optimus optics were, but still pretty darn solid as far as evil red eyes go. Another three AG-1 batteries can be installed into Starscream's spine, and a special set of tongs come with the figure entirely to help you remove the cover piece. This is a great touch, and they make it way easier, and they're maybe a little unnecessary, as the cover is large enough to get a hold of with my regular human fingers. Either way, the switch inside will light up Starscream's backpack boosters all cool and blue. Once again, great delivery on the feature, but in both cases, I really wish the switch was external. Optimus had two cleverly hidden buttons, and I feel there's no shortage of similar surfaces on Starscream to secrete a couple activation points so that I don't have to open the assembly just to turn the lights on and off. Outside of electronics, the live-action Screamer includes an alternate weaponized left forearm. Either forearm is secured by a sturdy peg just below the elbow, which is just on the cusp of being a little scary to yank on. By the way, a pair of replacement black rubber washers are included in a Ziploc taped to the instructions just in case you wear out the ones on the aforementioned sturdy peg. You've also got to attach the red cabling bundle, which is assisted by its unique stepped peg placement. A missile rack slash twin stabby thing can attach to the weapon arm, and if you got the retail version, it will probably stay there. I am assuming the Bambaland exclusive saw blade would be the other thing to plug on. The weapon arm looks ridiculous, just like in the films, with striking green and yellow paint on all six missiles. Unfortunately, the way that Starscream's forearm is supposed to transform into this remains completely unclear. But hey, his thumbs are still visible. There are a pair of clear stand pieces in the box as well to round out the accessories. They plug into the bottoms of Starscream's feet and give him solid flat surfaces to stand on, easy to install and barely noticeable. Thing is, and I wanna make this clear, up until now, just about every shot you've seen hasn't used them. The figure stands really well on his digitigrade talons alone. But hey, these add the extra touch of security your own display purposes may require. Starscream's head and neck is a double barbell ball socket system so the head can look around, and then the base of the neck can look around, and you can get some of this 
neck pumping action going on. A lot of cool poses. The actual stock of the double barbell ball joint is covered by this kind of rubbery scarf that looks like actual robot neck. And uh, it's a cool effect. Uh, means this guy can have a lot of personality in what he's doing with his head. Over here, the shoulders are uh, a series of joints. Number one, there is this ball socket connection for the little uh, piece of airplane, even though it doesn't transform. You can still wiggle this around and you can pop them off. And they might come popped off while you're doing stuff. It's happened to me a couple times. The entire shoulder itself can also separate here. And I'm not sure if this is entirely intentional, but it feels like it is. Because I think this is meant to be a hinge. Uh, this piece can move up out of the way. The instructions say about 30 degrees. So this whole thing here can move forward a little bit. The way that all this is working is, as you've probably noticed by now, some parts are hard plastic, some parts are rubbery plastic. Uh, the stuff that is rubbery plastic you might think is only the, the thin bits. It's more so only the bits that might come in contact with other bits all around in here. Because uh, some other thin bits like these are hard plastic. So basically, stuff is designed in a way so you can do this without too much risk. And uh, this isn't clicky or anything. This seems to be entirely friction based. And like I said, I think this is supposed to be a joint because this allows for some lateral uh, motion. But it also tabs back in over there if you don't want to do that stuff. The shoulder pad can hinge up and down and then this piece of the shoulder pad can swivel left and right. This is important because this stuff's pointy and hard plastic. This stuff is pointy and hard plastic. And uh, this is a paint chip and uh, just general scratching type risk area. So make sure things are out of the way before you do stuff. Shoulder can go forwards and backwards on uh, a very possibly lightly detented joint. Doesn't make any clicks. That one does though. And then uh, with this moved forward a little bit so it's not bumping into stuff back here, there's also a bicep swivel right here uh, to allow this to turn left and right. It's pure friction, but uh, it works okay. There's an elbow joint. Now this wire and this bit here, this is all rubbery plastic. So uh, you can just get that thing bending. You will want to twist the forearm a little though. And if you do want to twist the forearm, if it's straight, don't twist it because this and this, these two bits are hard plastic and they will collide and scratch. So move it forward a bit, get that clear of that. Then you can twist the forearm around to your heart's delight. Uh, down here on the wrist, the hand can hinge forward and backwards and swivel. Uh, this wire is soft plastic, so don't worry too much about pulling it too hard. As for the fingers, the way things work are that the two thumbs are on ball socket connections, which can pop them off, but it also means they have a large range of motion and twistability. And then there's also on each thumb a little hinged knuckle bit. As for the three major fingers, there is a hinge and a hinge. Uh, so two hinges per finger. And then at the base of the first hinge, you can swivel them around from side to side. This allows for not like perfect spread in and out type stuff, but like here you can see they're all spread out. And then if you want to have them come a little bit closer together, you can do this, curl them in a little bit. It looks okay from over here. Uh, as for making a fist, this guy can, uh, thanks to all that stuff being able to move around. The thing is, a three-finger, two-thumbed fist, I don't entirely know what it looks like, but I think that's that's pretty close. You can also get him to point pretty well. So it's a pretty cool hand, especially given how weird Starscream's finger design is on a basic level. Now up here on the torso, there's a whole lot of stuff to look at, but as far as moving parts, mostly on the back to be honest the little uh, jetpack pieces can uh, they are on double joints so they can click up and and in here or out this way it's interesting this piece here like these wing type pieces man do i wish those could like this that this block could just slide up because it gets in the way of these jetpack joints really being useful at all they basically allow for the jetpack bits to be kind of inactive, stored in here, or active and out. That's about the gist of what they're able to do. And if this could get out of the way, like these flaps, I think there would be just a little bit more interesting stuff going on. And like it's, it's wiggling, but I don't think it's meant to actually move. What is meant to move are these butt flaps down here. So these things can twiddle and they can rock. This is entirely for the waist joint because that gets them out of the way of the waist joint. The waist joint itself is just a big cut swivel. That's it. So I've done some inspecting on this guy. Like there's a divot carved out underneath the crotch plate to make way for the cockpit window. 
I think this is just a straight left and right swivel joint. There's no crunch anywhere in there. And let me tell you, if there's one thing I wish this guy could do, as far as major body-based points of regular articulation, it would be like either a forward or backward crunch or some kind of like pull up on here to reveal a ball socket joint or clicky universal joint. So you can get some torso roll. It's the only thing missing on him. It still, it makes him just have that extra touch of big clunky mechanical immobility that was kind of natural to all of the transforming movie Starscream toys. Uh, nonetheless, the waist joint is very helpful. And it's certainly something I'm, I don't recall being used to on most of the toys that came out for this guy when, when he was still fresh in the movie verse. So you know, take what you can, where you can get it. Now down here, uh, I mentioned before those little stand pieces, they're not installed right now. And he's standing fine. So like I said, the, the feet do a good enough job. The hips also do a good enough job. They can, well number one, there is a buttery clicky thigh swivel. A buttery clicky outward joint and then an equally buttery clicky forward and backward hip joint he's also got him some knees what with the digitigrade thing so the top knee can curl up pretty tight the bottom knee can more so straighten out than curl up and they both make some pretty good noises down here on the feet uh, unlike the movie Optimus toy that 3A did this guy does not just have simple ball socket ankles he has a whole array of joints down here uh at the very top the foot itself can swivel left and right on a dedicated clickety joint be very careful because this stuff's all hard plastic and as you saw there's a bit of flex and scratch going on this is about how far forward the foot can be uh, pivoted uh, as far as this kind of motion but it can go back a couple clicks just a couple clicks uh, this chunk here, these things can move around on their own. And I thought that was it for a while. And then while I was messing with him, I was like, man, I wish he had an ankle tilt. And I discovered, because I noticed that this plastic is the, the bendy plastic. He does have an ankle tilt. It might be kind of, I guess, either paint stuck or just, you know, basic assembly stuck. But he can. It's not even a clicky joint. That click is just it becoming unstuck. He can tilt his ankles in about that far. So, uh, this guy is pretty nicely darn posable and he's got a good build quality to his joints the only major joint i feel like he's missing is some kind of mid torso thing i don't even know what it would be uh but otherwise like i i really like playing around with this guy i found a lot of good poses for him and i've also found him to be imminently stable for the most part and that's the thing that i was most impressed by given that he's got these digitigrade leg things Oh, also, if you're wondering about uh, the weaponized arm, this thing has still got his thumbs, so those are still attached by ball socket joints, and they still have their little thumb hinge for whatever good that will do you. And then uh, it can still swivel at the connection point like the original forearm could. There is a heavily de-dent detented uh, ratchet joint here for spinning, like the whole thing. And then up here, the connection point for the weapon option has its own detented uh, ratchet point. This is mostly useful, I think, for if you have the saw blade, but, you know, if you want these pointy, stabby things pointed a certain way uh, for stabbing things, as I just explained, then you got yourself some options. I laid this out in the 3A Optimus review, and the same statement stands here. This is a roundabouts $400 action figure of a live-action Transformers movie design on a fairly massive scale. If you aren't a movie former fan, or are generally on the fence about that stuff, I don't think this figure's made to change any minds. All that said, Starscream also hits the same general high points that Optimus did. His visual quality is super friggin' strong, and I think his weathering came out a whole lot more natural looking than the Autobot leaders. His hand feel factor is delightful, with an array of joints that are beefcake confident to interact with. And where I felt Optimus had potential weakness in his ball socket ankles, Starscream has rock solid stature in his multi ratcheted ankles. Triangle Birdman's arms have a lot more potential parts collision though, so be careful. The instructions are pretty good about laying out all the parts that might scratch and all the parts that might snap if you start cranking joints left and right in his elbows or his shoulders. 
I find it pretty darn cool to handle a high-end action figure of one of the weirdest live-action movie Transformers designs, and I'm pleased to once again see 3A trying real hard to make sure that their big robot toys can play like big robot toys. I hate feeling fearful when interacting with a multi-hundred dollar action figure, and I hope this level of tactile quality is maintained as the company proceeds into their G1-styled lineup. Anyway, this has been Internet Personality Vangelis, and messing around with a pair of high-end movie former figures has finally made me begin to understand the people that buy those super expensive statues of the same designs. Except, these are less expensive and actually do stuff. I guess there shall still forever be a gap between you and I, statue collector.